Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Greg McManus. I'm Chief Executive here at Waitangi, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Waitangi Treaty Grounds and to Te Kaumapu, this museum tonight. This is the first exhibition that opening that we have attempted during the COVID pandemic. So I want to thank all of you for your understanding and cooperation in following the health protocols in place. Normally we would have a much larger crowd for an event like this, but with the restrictions in place, the few of us who are lucky to be here tonight will have to make the evening a special one on behalf of those who can't be here. Tonight we open a very special exhibition, the Children's Holocaust Memorial, which remembers the 1.5 million children murdered in the Holocaust. Shortly we'll be hearing from our guest speakers from the Holocaust Centre of New Zealand. And I'd like to commend the Centre for its work, not only in remembering the victims of one of the greatest tragedies of human history, but also for tirelessly working to inspire individuals to stand up against prejudice, discrimination and apathy in the face of human rights violations around the world, including New Zealand. I think it's absolutely appropriate that we host this exhibition here at Waitangi. The central mission of the Waitangi National Trust is to illustrate the ongoing promise of Waitangi to the world. That promise is for a world based on mutual respect, tolerance and understanding. The lesson we learn from studying the Holocaust and remembering its countless victims is just how easily intolerance can turn to tragedy under the right circumstances. On Anzac Day, we say, lest we forget after reciting the Ode of Remembrance, sorry, the Ode to the Fallen. The same sentiment applies to our remembrance of what happened during the Holocaust, and indeed in any of the countless tragedies throughout human history. I am a descendant of Eastern European Jews who emigrated from Lithuania to Ireland in the early 20th century, most likely to escape persecution from the Russians. My paternal grandfather was named Joseph Jacob, Anglicised name. He was a butcher by trade and he moved from Ireland to Scotland and settled in the Knightswood area of Glasgow where my family still live. We know from birth and marriage records that he changed his surname from Jacob to McManus, as so many Jewish immigrants changed or anglicised their names. And we know from family letters that he visited the synagogue in secret all his life. I'm pretty sure that my father, who left home on his 17th birthday, to run away to sea, ending up in New Plymouth, <laughs> and never returning home, did not know of his Jewish heritage. He never spoke of it to us, and it was only after his death in 1994 that my cousin in the UK discovered the papers and letters of her late mother that would begin to flesh out this chapter of our family story. I tell this brief personal story mostly for the benefit of my youngest daughter, who is here tonight. She knows nothing of her Jewish heritage and has never experienced the forces that would compel her ancestors to leave the country of their birth in the face of persecution and prejudice, only to arrive in a new country where similar forces compelled her great-grandfather to change his name and to practice his faith in secret. 
She now knows this part of her story, and it is my hope that she tells it to her own children in time. When I reflect on my own family's story, I cannot help but think of the stories of the children represented in this exhibition, those whose portraits are on the wall, and those represented by a button in, this exhibi uh, um, in the exhibition beside you. As I was looking through this gallery earlier today, I wondered if any of those children might actually be related to my children. Um, the ones whose parents and grandparents didn't manage to get away to a safer place. We need to remember them and all of their stories, and we need to keep telling those stories through exhibitions such as this. Shortly we'll hear from Chris Clancy, an exhibition director at the Holocaust Centre of New Zealand who will speak on behalf of the centre's chairwoman, Deb Hart. Then we will hear from the designer of the memorial, Matthias Celia, before Chris returns to deliver the opening address. To finish the formal part of the evening, we will have a poetry reading from Nimish Singh from Kerry Kerry High School. And then Caitlin Timmer Aarons, the curator of this museum, will invite you all to interact with the memorial in a very special way. So thank you all again so much for coming. Um, we really appreciate your attendance tonight. I hope you um, enjoy the evening. And before I introduce Chris, I'm going to ask my staff to come forward and Willy Teddy is going to lead us in a way to Texas Hoki, e noho ana o ki nainai. Ki ngatini mate o rato o te whakamahara tanga o te parakura tamariki, kua fetu rangitia. E mihi ana ki a koto te mana whenua nei, no e, te fer, no e tu whera i tene ahi ahi. Ki ora ki a tato, kua uihui mai i ten, tene ahi ahi. Ko Christopher Clancy, Toku Ingoa, Noreira, Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Katoa. Bruchim, Shabbat Shalom, good evening and welcome. A message from Deborah Hart, Chair of the Holocaust Center of New Zealand. Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Katoa, Shabbat Shalom. I am so sorry that I cannot be with you today, 
but I am stuck in Auckland, like many others who wish to be with you this evening. I thank our hosts and acknowledge Greg McManus, the chief executive of Waitangi Treaty Grounds. There is a whakatoki that is so apt for this day. He ho mato ka tokia te kiri, ma te rohanui ka ora ano. A cold wind chills us, love and goodwill restores us. We stand here in this very special place, Waitangi, the place where an agreement between Maori and Pakeha was drafted and where 43 chiefs signed Te Tiriti, two peoples forging a future together. This evening, we are here to think about, to remember and to cherish 1.5 million children who were murdered on the other side of the world. Why is it that it is so poignant to have this memorial in this place? I think it's because this place is about looking back with honesty about what happened here, what we promised each other, and what we have done since, and looking to the future, and what it is that we must do for one another. In this place, of all places, the birthplace of this nation, we look back with honesty at the Holocaust, the murder of six million Jews for the sole crime of being Jews. Among those murdered were 1.5 million of the most innocent, children. We are reminded that hate starts small, and as we look to the future, we recommit ourselves that we must all work together to crush hate wherever it appears. It is what we must do for one another. At the Holocaust Center of New Zealand, our mission is to inspire and empower action against anti-Semitism, discrimination, and apathy by remembering, educating, and bearing witness to the Holocaust. It is a mission that we take very seriously as we teach thousands of children each year about the Holocaust and empower them to be upstanders, not bystanders, against hatred. Kia ora. In 2017, the Holocaust Center of New Zealand approached Matthias Silje, who was a senior lecturer at Massey University in Design, to create the Children's Holocaust Memorial. Please welcome Matthias to speak about the tutorial. Um, thank you, Chris, for the opportunity to say a few things to everyone about this memorial. First, I would like to acknowledge Man Fenua, who represented by Isaya Apiata and Muri Teri. Thank you very much for welcoming us with this uh, traveling memorial onto your land to look, to look after us and to host you for some time that we're going to be here with us. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's your blessing that has made it possible to realize the intention of this memorial. And we're very, very grateful to you. Thank you, Caitlin Timmer Arends, Chanel Clark, for assisting us in the last couple of days with the installation and making sure that everything runs really well. It was a joy and a delight to work with you. Um, tonight I'm going to talk to you about how this memorial came about and I'll share somewhat critical thoughts about what we commemorate, how and what this means. Um, first things first. Um, what you see here is a teaching aid that was developed by a school teacher, Justine Hitchcock. Sorry that this picture is very small, black and white. Um, Justine of Moriah Jewish Day School in Wellington wanted to show to her pupils how many children is actually one and a half million. And so the project she came up with was getting her pupils to collect one button for each child. Um, and that took those children over two and a half years to collect these buttons. In 2010, the Holocaust Center of New Zealand took care of the buttons after the school closed, and for a good seven years tried in vain to find an interested venue or party who could do something with all these buttons. Quite a unique collection to do something with. But there was no interest. 
this was perhaps, and this is my own speculation, because a memorial of innocent children comes with an unusual complexity and pain. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed very hard to connect with perhaps the somewhat formatted tradition of war commemoration in New Zealand, where the focus is often more on combatants. I'll give you some insight in the design of this memorial. Um, so in 2017 or early 2018, after long briefings, we explored the idea that if we can't find any permanent space, why not make this a traveling memorial? And so that is how what we set out to do. Um, the design process started, and in doing so I prepared several conceptual pages for the Holocaust Center to go over and to look, that's what we often do, so that we leave no stone unturned and we have a really good ground to talk about different design options. And this is one of the pages, we call this the page of the round things, uh, as you can see. Um, this, is, um, this page shows that the memorial attempts to remember lives. It's about children who went to school, who sang songs, who were at times cheeky, who liked to play together or sometimes play quietly by themselves. Children from all kinds of backgrounds. Children from wealthy homes. Children who lived in ghettos. Before I had the chance to actually see these buttons with my own eyes, I made some preconceptions about what it would be like. And um, what did they say about a shoe? <laughs> saying. Uh, my assumption was quite wrong. Well, I had something like this in mind. Um, this is done on the, on the back of an invoice, I think. I made this a small pencil scribble. How wrong I was, because once I got access to all these buttons, and I did some measuring and weight samples, I had uh, only then an idea of the true extent of all these buttons. Now, I want to say something about numbers and bigness and all these things. The spectacle of numbers can be compelling, but if an audience indulges too much into that, it can distract easily from the nuance that you are trying to convey. However, since you are all an informed audience, I think it is permissible to share some numbers with you as well. And this image was a little bit more close to what we see here. Justine's pupils at Moriah School collected a volume of 1.25 cubic meters of buttons. And that has a weight of nearly one metric ton. 0.98 metric ton. And that's the same weight of the Mitsubishi Mirage with a full tank. <laughs> it turned out that this idea of traveling um, was a blessing because this wandering memorial that we have designed has by now reached 190,000 visitors in Aotearoa. And there is also much interest overseas. Justine's concept of the teaching aid stands mostly on its own, and very little we've done to interfere with that, other than make holders for buttons. As the construction progressed during most of 2018, groups of volunteers painstakingly hand cleaned and counted each button since they had been in storage for such a long time. So every button was looked at, held, cared for, cleaned and counted and acknowledged. This project connects people from all walks of life. So every Thursday morning, uh, people would come together over the year. These were church groups, including the Church of Latter-day Saints, Anglicans, Presbyterians, human rights groups, iwi like Te Atiawa, Ngati Tora, Natira, Taranaki Fanui, student organizations, and school groups, and refugee groups, and gay rights activists, and people from the Jewish community, including Holocaust survivors and their children. While this cleaning was underway, so was the construction. Here's a, a scale model actually made of cardboard of the idea of the memorial before we had it. And this is when 
the, uh, all the stuff began to come together quite well. And here's the memorial being installed in one of the venues. This is the Manua, I believe. And here's an image taken when it traveled to Dunedin. This memorial has practically seen every transport depot in the country. Traveling with it allowed me to learn how this story resonates with different communities. And I could observe how the Holocaust gets commemorated. I would now like to share some of my personal thoughts on Holocaust commemoration. A common sentence that we hear the world over is, never again. And I bet that the Waitangi educators who got their refresher yesterday from Chris um, on this very heavy topic can wholeheartedly find themselves in that statement, never again. But I can't help wonder what do these words actually mean, never again. And how are we actually doing with our never again? Let's take a step back. Last month, I was listening to a historian, Dr. Giacomo Lichtner, who is connected with the Holocaust Center of New Zealand. And he was considering the tricky two-sidedness of Holocaust commemoration that I'm going to try to explain to you. On one hand, the Holocaust was a uniquely premeditated event, inconceivable in scale and in impact. But if one begins to compare the Holocaust with the grief of other atrocities, one often ends up in a misguided quasi-logic comparing apples with cows and diluting the uniqueness and trivializing the unspeakable experiences of the Holocaust. On the other hand, if the Holocaust would be a no-go zone for important lessons for now and for the future, then we miss out on the most compelling lessons from the past. So there you have that two-sidedness, that question, this balancing act that you need to do if you want to connect this with now. So we need to be cautious, not to get lost in easy assumptions. But we can recognize some common problematic tendencies which fueled many horrific events in human history, including the Holocaust. So it comes in from a different angle. And these tendencies, the problematic tendencies of exclusion, the fear of others, or the exploitation of other groups or colonial processes, these are mindsets which do not recognize the integrity and human rights of all people. Coming back to my question, never again, how are we doing? Um, in 2019, with a group of colleagues at Massey University, we looked at some data from the United Nations and other non-government organizations to figure out how many children have actually died since 1945 in conflicts that are driven by religion or so-called ethnic cleansing or genocide. Atrocities which are often committed by dominant groups unto minorities. And then I calculated how many more buttons would those school children need to collect beyond the Holocaust Memorial. So here is the CAD drawing earlier on before we built this thing so we knew how big it would be. But if we add more the, the subsequent buttons to that, we come to approximately additional 5,106,000 children. We are no longer talking about the Holocaust in this context, but we do talk about events that have common underlying themes. And we can witness these themes everywhere. Currently, Uyghur Muslims are held in concentration camps in China. We know this. We can't ignore this. And when we begin to talk about problematic tendencies closer to home, we may think of the murders in the mosques in Christchurch. And we see some more normalized forms of white supremacy in our own communities. A very common story in Aotearoa, and that is probably a parallel, Greg, to what you've been talking about. Moms and dads making the painful decision to replace their ancient indigenous name 
for English sounding names because no landlord and no employer ever bothered to reply to a job application or an application for a rental flat. That may be very far from the Holocaust experience, absolutely, but the underlying tendencies are painfully common. Why does this matter in Aotearoa? The Holocaust started small, but it grew very rapidly. A well-known Holocaust victim, Anne Frank, was born in a democracy and not just 15 years later died in the greatest monstrosity. It can happen just like that. It is our intention that the Children's Holocaust Memorial is a reminder to be alert, close to home, and to foster humanity towards all people. Norera, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. The opening of the memorial here at Waitangi, of which one of the meetings is Weeping Waters, is an auspicious and fitting place to hold the memorial. I would like to thank Mana Fenua, Greg McManus, Isaiah Apiata, and the staff of the Waitangi Treaty Grounds for enabling the memorial to be here. Each one of the 1.5 million Jewish children murdered and represented by this memorial, as well as the unknown numbers of Polish, disabled, Romani, and children in occupied Soviet lands, both named and unnamed, represented a world unto him and herself. Born into a world full of possibilities, their lives were cut short at the hands of hate and intolerance. The world still weeps for the loss of life and the loss of innocence. All communities, all cultures, place an emphasis on protecting the next generation. Mothers and fathers have crossed oceans, braved war-torn lands, gone hungry to ensure that children had food, all in the name of protecting and providing for their children. The idea that someone would harm our youth is such an anathema. Myths and legends from around the world talk about the horrors visited upon those who would harm the innocent. When the Nazis began their march toward the annihilation of the civilized world, no one would have thought that they would have targeted the most vulnerable in our society. When we speak of the dead in the Holocaust, too often we get lost in the numbers, like 1.5 million. It's inconceivable to the human mind to even imagine what that would look like. But we must never forget that those 1.5 million children were individuals with names and faces, hopes and fears, friends and families, just like each and every one of us in this room. Around the world, monuments and memorials have been erected and held to honor the lives of those lost during the Holocaust. A place of pilgrimage for survivors, a moment to remember for the lost, the role of these places and events often does not move beyond the immediate. At the Holocaust Center of New Zealand, our role is to ensure that we move beyond the immediate and into the long-term effects of our memorials and events. It is the goal of the Holocaust Center of New Zealand to educate all students in Aotearoa, New Zealand on the Holocaust. Without education, not only are we doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past, we re-victimize the dead. We reduce them to only one moment of importance, their death. Learning about the Holocaust, remembering the victims, goes beyond the facts and figures of the events. As each one of us tonight entered the memorial space, we took a special responsibility upon ourselves. Each of the buttons you see represents the life of a single child, lost to the worst of inhumanity, neutrality, and apathy. But ask yourself, why buttons? Something that is seemingly insignificant and mundane, they represent the greatest of all treasures, life and memory. The choice to use buttons was to convey the individuality of each victim, the uniqueness that was their lives. They provide for us a focus to remember and honor those lives. In Judaism, we speak of memory, zahor, in the present tense. It is our way of establishing a connection to a location, to a home that has been lost. Through successive exiles and expulsions, 
culminating in the ultimate demise during the reign of Nazi terror. When we go through the exhibition, we enter the world of living memory. Through ritual and objects, memory is held for an instant. But in each one of us, memory is held eternally. Each time we speak of the dead, we give them their voice back. Each time we tell the stories of their lives, we ensure that their deaths were not in vain. Each time we honor the dead, we give them back the humanity that was stripped from them. Collective responsibility is the idea that not only are we responsible for ourselves, but responsible for our communities. As you walk through the memorial, you take upon yourself the responsibility of being a living witness. Each one of us must tell the stories of these children. It is our collective responsibility to give the dead their voices back. Ensure that the world does not forget. The ultimate goal of the Nazis and their collaborators was not to just kill every single Jew in the world, but to completely erase us from the annals of history. When we speak of the memories of the dead, we bring them into the world of living memory. While the Nazis may have been stopped in their goal, when we forget to speak, we have killed them all over again. Tonight begins the weekly celebration of Shabbat, the day of rest. Jews around the world will take the next 25 hours to not only separate ourselves from the work week, but also to have a time of contemplation and renewal. Through prayer and community, we reconnect ourselves with our past, our faka papa, and our memory. Shabbat is a time when children gather to receive from their parents the blessing that has been passed down from generation to generation. Even in the midst of horror and destruction, parents would give this blessing to their children, hoping it would be the shield to protect them from the Nazis and bring them to a life of peace. It's fitting that the opening of this memorial is tonight. On our day of rest, we remember those that were not given that chance. We remember those cut down in their prime, taken from this world too soon. We restore the mana rested from the victims. Throughout the next 25 hours, I ask of you, how will we continue to honor the lives of these children and the other victims of the Holocaust? As a living witness, how will we ensure that the memories of those murdered are not lost, destined to become a footnote in history books? How can we bring to fruition the axiom, never forget, never again? These questions, more thoughts, and numerous emotions go through our minds as we contemplate what it means to be a living witness and a voice for the dead. Yet, it has never been more succinctly said on the reason why it is up to us to ensure that we continue our mission. Kotato nakaru matara mo te hunga mate me te hunga ora kaore e faiti mai ta tato kawenga ki nga pumahara aneke o te hunga mate he kawenga ano to tato ki te mai mo i awa pumahara. Avo hameti ve avo hachaim aleno le hiot edim. Shaken Rorak Shano Achaim, the Zichonot Hametim, Anu Achaim, Gam, the Mashaanu, Osim, Yim, Otam Zichonot. For the dead and the living, we must bear witness. For not only are we responsible for the memories of the dead, we are also responsible for what we do with those memories. These words, spoken by Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel, encapsulate the meaning of the Children's Holocaust Memorial and the work of the Holocaust Center of New Zealand. They are the driving force for those whose life work it is to erase hatred, bigotry, and discrimination from this planet. The events of the Holocaust have reverberating effects, not just in the Jewish community, but around the world. We are living in a time of rising hatred, nationalism, and isolationism. For the dead and the living, we must fight against the tides that pull us apart drawing upon the memories of those who have passed to give us strength to do what is right. Kia ora, tada ba, thank you. Oh, say shalom memrama, uya say shalom aleinu, vea go Israel. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, ve'ako Yisrael, 
יעשה שלום, יעשה שלום, שלום עלינו ועכו ישראל, יאמרו אמן. May he who makes peace in the heavens grant peace to us and to all our people, and let us say, Amen. Amen. In 2018, the Children's Holocaust Memorial opened at the National Library, where it was on display for three and a half months before the memorial began its national tour. When we left the National Library, they gifted us a string of buttons and a box of buttons to be given to each subsequent venue to symbolize a nationwide connection to the commemoration of the vict victims of the Holocaust, as well as to remind us of the need to be interconnected and vigilant against hate and intolerance. We would like to invite Greg McManus and Isaiah Abiata to receive these tawanga to be held here at the museum. Halina Bionbaum was born in 1929 in Warsawa, Poland, to an average middle-class Jewish family. Growing up, she had loving parents, two older brothers, and was entering year four when the Nazis invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, the Nazis bombed the predominantly Jewish section of Warsawa. At the age of 11, Halina and her family, along with over 400,000 Polish Jews, were sealed into the Warsaw ghetto, an area the size of 1.5 square miles. Lack of food, restrictive laws, and the ever-looming threat of deportation and death hung over their lives. With the destruction of the ghetto in 1943, at the age of 14, Halina and her family were deported to the killing center of Maidana, and later to Auschwitz. For two years, she survived the worst death camp, death marches, disease, and starvation. She was eventually liberated by the Soviet army at Neustadt Kleve in 1945, at the age of 16. When she returned to Warsaw, Alina found that there were no survivors from her family, except for one brother, Marek, who was 11 years older than she was. Together, they left Poland in 1947 to rebuild their lives in the Holy Land, where the, with thousands of other Holocaust survivors, they worked to rebuild a new nation. Alina is one of Israel's most prolific writers on personal events of the Holocaust as well as a celebrated poet. At 92 years old, and in fact, I think it's 93 as of this weekend, she's still an active writer and continues to tell her story of survival. Please welcome Nimish Singh, deputy head boy at Kerry Kerry High School, as he reads, My Life Started From The End, by Helena Bierenbaum. My life started from the end. I have known death, then birth. I was growing amidst hatred in the kingdom of destruction, only to learn later about creation, breathing bleakness, fires, deterioration of feeling. This was the atmosphere of my childhood. My life began from the end, and just then, everything returned to the beginning. I was resurrected. It was all not in vain, not in vain, because goodness is not less powerful than evil. In me is strength too. I am the proof.
screen printer. Sorry about that little bit of slowness on my way up. I couldn't remember where I'd left my speech. <laughs> uh, my name is Caitlin Tamarins and I'm the curator of Te Kungahu Museum of Waitangi in which we stand and sit right now. I would like to thank the Holocaust Centre of New Zealand and each and every one of you for coming tonight to the opening of the Children's Holocaust Memorial Te Whakamahara Tango o Te Parakura Tamariki. A special thank you to my colleagues Chanel Clark and also Tane Van de Donk for helping with the setup um, of the last few days. Tane actually bled for this exhibition. He accidentally cut his finger, um, and so he has shared what for this memorial. As Greg shared his Jewish heritage tonight, I will similarly share my connection to the memorial through my Romani ancestry. Generations ago, my Romani ancestor settled in Wazapa in the Netherlands where my family remained for generations, including during the Second World War. After the war, my Ongo and Opa immigrated to New Zealand, though much of my family remains in the Netherlands. Romani children were killed in the Holocaust, also are represented in this memorial. Tonight, we invite each and every one of you to take a box which holds a single button inside. This button represents the life of a child that was inexplicably, irrevocably, cut short by hate. By placing the button in the memorial, you have symbolically fulfilled the mitzvah, commandment to remember the dead. So I will lead us off, and Greg, if you'd like to follow, and everyone as well, we're going to head round, pick up our button, open the box, and place the button in the open case. Once we've done that, we will come through underneath the largest of the uh, tables and resume our seats.